pulled it up on ESPN3. She, she's the mechanic in our house. And she's a, we're both season ticket holders, and she's just not feeling up to traveling, and I didn't want to leave her alone. And I talked to Coach Hurley on Wednesday. Uh, we talk almost every week, and I often go to practice. And uh, I'd go to a lot more of them if he didn't have 9 o'clock in the morning workouts. <laughs> Coach, but, let me, let me yeah, ask you I was first. able to get the game and watch it very well um, on ESPN3. And uh, Mike Crispino and, and Derek Wittenberg were doing the game, and, and they're pretty good. They're good announcers. And, you know, there were a few calls that they went Rhode Island's way, and there was no question about the calls. You know, the technical foul, which was absolutely ridiculous because there was no de- – demonstrating going on there was no nobody trying to make a fool out of anyone and the the announcers never never said who the technical was on they couldn't figure it out and they have the advantage of replay and uh they also called an out of bounds play when roadie was down three and the ball was clearly off ohio state and ref official a number three official Ray Perone, who at best is a below average official, overruled Mike Kitts, who's a Final Four official, and said it was Ohio State ball. The announcers both said it was Rhode Island's. They questioned the call, which announcers rarely do these days, uh, unless I'm doing color. But that those were two crucial calls against the Rams, and yet they still fought. Uh, they ran uh, Coach Hurley's offense extremely well, uh, and uh, I thought Coach Hurley was really good just at the right time. It allowed him to use Jordan Hare, keep Milosevic in the game as much as possible uh, because he did have four fouls, and it, it put a little pressure on Ohio State because they didn't start – nailing threes uh, until they had those extra possessions. They hit a couple of threes uh, when Rhodey was within three points. So, you know, I, I watched the game like a coach and like a point guard, what I used to play, and Rhode Island played as well as they can possibly play this early in the season with a new coach and uh, who they have played up to this point in the season. I've, I've tried to tweet and, 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 you know, educate fans who might not understand the situation that Danny Hurley inherited. There, there's no front court scoring, and, and their front court not only unproven, but, you know, I see them in practice. They're not scoring in practice. Uh, their guards... <laughs> Their guards, I think, will come along. I think uh, Danny Hurley and Bobby Hurley are great teachers. Uh, and, and if these guards, like they play tonight, and I consider Milosevic a guard because he puts the ball on the deck really well. You know, it, you got Monford, Milosevic, Powell, and Malone. If they'll play relaxed basketball and just... You know, don't overdo the system is what I always used to say. I, I would run an offense, but I didn't necessarily want them to run it uh, for the sake of running it. it. It's looking to score when opportunities are there, and I think the kids are picking up on that. And that's something that Dan really has been trying to get through. Coach, let me ask you about Hare, because in the first couple of games, he looked a little lost out there, and then it looked like he played a little bit better today. Does he have the potential that the recruits were saying when they were saying one of the top 30 big guys and all that stuff? Well, first of all, rating services, you know, 90% of them are a joke. You and I could sit down and look at a couple magazines and come up with our own top 25 and, and not see anybody and put it out there. So you, you can say... This and that. Um, I know people in Michigan, and uh, you know I know the Michigan State people. I know the Michigan people, and you know they they didn't recruit Jordan. 
Jordan is a perfect A-10 player. Not ready as a freshman, but he's going to grow, you know, he's going to fill out. Uh, unless he's eating uh, uh, a special diet where he's not getting any carbs. <laughs> he's he's, he's going to be a player because I see him in practice. Uh, and he runs the floor very well. And in drills, he's competing but he's nervous during the games. Today was the first sign uh, when he knocked down his free throws. You know, he, he was four for four from the foul line. That shows that he was not nervous. And as the season goes on, I'm sure as he fits into the offense, they'll run some things for him. But it's rare when you run things for a freshman, unless they're volume shooters that can can get you 25 points a game. You know, I, I never worried about how many shots Tommy Garrett took when I coached him back in 1987-88. You know, Tommy was a volume shooter. I told him never to look over to the bench or I'd take him out. And if he didn't take a shot that I thought he should, he was going to come out. So that's how I coached to get Tommy to relax. You've got to play the game Focused but relaxed, and I think Jordan was extremely tight in his first two games. He didn't look himself at all, and I did see both games. So, you know, it, it's a a process for him. The ratings on kids are sometimes the biggest sin that could ever happen to a kid because, you know, he, he was overrated in that one system that they're talking about. And what, when that happens... It makes the kid look bad. It makes the coach look bad. It, it, there's just no value to those things. But people sell them. People want to buy them. Uh, and, and as I said, 90% of those publications are a total, total joke, and they never see the kids. They never find out who, who's really recruiting them. They might talk to an assistant coach who landed the kid, and the assistant coach might want to get a promotion, and he tells the scouting service how great the kid is. I'm not saying that's what happened with Jordan, but, you know, he's a nice player and a player that Danny Hurley thinks, you know, can play in his system eventually. It's just don't expect big things from him for a while, Point ten rebound game. But it's going to happen sometime this year, and then he's just going to grow and get better and better and better. I've had it happen a hundred times to players that I've coached over the years. Coach, let me go back in time a little bit because you mentioned that, and um, I want to get back to what you mentioned. And going back to the Syracuse game that I just watched, thanks to one of these guys, uh, Kenny Green, who we interviewed from Qatar, he's coaching in another country. Um, uh-huh. When I when I went back there, Coach, it said that you took over the team only a couple of weeks before that season. I mean, what was that like? Bring us back to that and give us some insight into that year because we were really excited as fans that year when you got there. Yeah, Brenda Malone was the coach before me, and uh, he had uh, seven wins and nine wins his first two years, and he was on a three-year contract. Uh, and he did what I would have done. He He, he was... He was an associate, as I am, with Hubie Brown, who was the head coach of the Knicks. Hubie needed an assistant, and Brendan, Brendan took the job in late August of, of that year, 1986. Well, Bob Griffin, the football coach, knew my dad. He had practice taught under him. My dad was a phys ed teacher and high school athletic director in Stratford, Connecticut, and Bob was from Milford. And Bob called me and just wanted to tell the athletic director, John Chuckran, if I was interested, that that he knew me and that I would be interested. And I did say I wanted, you know, I would love to talk to the Rhode Island Conference days when it was Rhode Island against Connecticut. And at one time I was in uh, in our in our wins, and uh, we had great battles with the Rams. So I knew all about Rhode Island and my mom was born in the state of Rhode Island in West. When they called me, uh, or John Chuckering called me, 
I told him on, on the phone uh, that I one job that I would leave Fordham University for would be the University of Rhode Island. And he said, well, we have a state law that says we have to search for so many days and 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 uh, all I want to tell you is I will call you later on this month and for sure we'll have you up for an interview. Well, they called me on, on September 30th. John Chuckran called and said, can you come up tomorrow? And I said, absolutely. I drove up there and I believe my press conference was October 2nd and I arrived on campus October 4th. And I had never seen the team. The only player I had seen at all in high school was Phil Collins, their, their lefty point guard, who averaged about 12 points uh, for Brendan Malone's team the year before. I never heard of Tommy, uh, Kenny Green, Monty Carson. They weren't kids that I recruited or came across in my recruiting. Uh, so it, I was totally in the dark, but I didn't care. I, I said, I know I can recruit to Rhode Island. Uh, I'll get through the first year. And then we had our first practice on October 15th, and I had some scrimmage uh, time in there, and I, I felt really good. I was so excited October 15th that I could hardly sleep that night. I remember exactly. I was living on campus. Uh, in one of the graduate dormitories. I, I couldn't sleep because I was excited. And then Tommy Garrick, uh, I was told uh, by the athletic director that he was a great football player, and that Coach Malone had told him that he should play football. But Tommy had such a love for basketball, he wanted to see who the new coach was going to be. And... Uh, after the first day of practice, I remember telling Tommy, I said, Tommy, I really think you, know, you have a chance to, to be oh, 20 points a game in my system. And he looked at me kind of funny. He said, really? And I said, yes. And after about two more practices, I called him over after practice. I said, Tommy, I think you can play in the NBA. And he was, and he, he was just, dumbfounded, didn't know what to say, and I said, but it's not going to happen until you believe what I believe. And I laid down the rules to him about shooting and what he had to do. He always hustled. He was always a great defensive player. I could teach him very little except how not to get in foul trouble. And he's such a coachable kid. And there were times, the only times I got angry at Tommy was when he didn't shoot enough. And I always wanted to have a coach who, who treated me that way. It didn't happen. Uh, but, you know, it, it was amazing how that team transformed into a team that was picked for last place in the Atlantic 10. I remember at the media day in Philadelphia, after about three weeks of practice, we had our media day, and I told the audience... Uh, we had to speak in front of about, uh, oh, I'd say 100 people and all the media in Philadelphia and throughout the league. And Temple was number one in the country uh, the previous year and preseason that particular year with John Cheney at the helm. So I said, if we're the last place team in this league, this must be one hell of a league because I really love this team that I inherited. And I, I mentioned Tommy and, and, and Silk. I said, I think they have a chance to be one of the best backcourts in the East. And by the end of the season, I said, I haven't seen a better backcourt in the entire country. And I, I was serious about it, as I always was when I promoted my kids. And I never, I never worried about promoting kids as long as I knew it wouldn't go to their heads and it would not be a negative. With Tommy and Carlton, uh, you know, Silk, that's his real name, it was Carlton. Those two kids were like having two coaches on the floor. Their decision-making was exceptional. The players, the other guys, all believed in them. Everybody knew 
what they could do and, and where they were going to get the ball as we went on in that season. And we won 20 games, and we should have been in the NCAA that year. We were passed over by West Virginia, who we had beaten twice, uh, and, and started off the season with a huge upset at Virginia in their own tournament. And then we, we took Providence uh, to the woodshed 92-70 to 70 early on. That's probably in our fifth or sixth game of the season. And, uh, yeah, the rest is hist- history. I mean, we were seriously a bucket away from the Final Four that year. And, and I, I t- in my coaching career. Coach, let me ask you this. A lot of people didn't know that you would have stayed at Rhode Island if they offered you any decent money at all. Give us a feel for how that went down, because when you threw the numbers out last time I had you on my show, I couldn't believe how little they were offering then. Yeah, when I came to Rhodey, it was uh, $47,500, and that's what Brendan Malone was making. And I was making about $60,000 at at Fordham University as, as my salary. Uh, and the Reebok people who had tremendous respect for me and what I had done at Fordham gave me, you know, I would say 25000 more when I moved up to Rhode Island closer to them and the potential of more exposure in the Atlantic 10. So with a shoe contract, and, and the, I think my second year, I got bumped up to maybe 49000 after winning 20, uh, no more years on my contract. Uh, so we, we didn't, we didn't uh, get five- and six-year contracts back in that day, and I was happy. I knew I could win, and I was recruiting extremely well at Rhode Island. You know, I had Carlos Easterling and Jeff Kent, you know, along with, you know, some really good returners like Bonzi and, Colson, Kenny Green, John Evans, and with Carlos Easterling and, and some of the other guys that we had on our ball club, I felt we were going to stay right around the, you know, the top two or three in the Atlantic 10. So, you know, I, I was not looking or thinking of leaving at all. And uh, some alumni talked to me about helping, you know, raise uh, my salary and you know, I just said, you know, whatever, I, I I don't, it's not important to me. But then at the Final Four that year, Texas called me. They had an intermediary actually come face-to-face with me to tell me they were interested in me. I didn't even know the athletic director's name. I didn't know the position was open. And I said, oh, okay. I have to call my athletic director first. I did. He said, yeah, go ahead, and I'll, uh, I'll tell the president, who at that time was Ted Eddy, and you have, you know, you have my permission. So I, I went to the interview. Uh, it ended up being a three-and-a-half-hour interview, and they basically told me they wanted me. Uh, I was their guy, and I said, Wait, I, I I've got to talk to Rhode Island and uh, and give them the courtesy of, of knowing what's going on here. And my wife is with me. Uh, I would never accept a job until I saw the facilities. Uh, and you haven't even discussed money yet. I mean, I don't. My wife is interested in that area. <laughs> And they kind of laughed, and they, they put on a piece of paper, $500,000. And I looked, and, and I remember thinking, now how do I act calm and cool <laughs> <laughs> over this? Uh, ten times what I was making. <laughs> and my, my wife did not want to leave Rhode Island. Uh, and when I told her what the salary was, she said, well, where's Austin? And we took a private jet that the University of Texas provided down to Austin, and the very next day we had the press conference. 
And uh, I called up some of my good friends in Rhode Island so they wouldn't have to read about it, including the athletic director and president, and thanked them for everything. And I said, you know, if, if your real friends will still be friends, and that's basically what they said, but one of our biggest boosters, uh, Bob Torino, who still is a, a Ram sure. uh, booster, oh, Bobby, Bobby and I were very close. And Bobby said, but you have to promise me one thing. And I said, sure, Bobby, what is that? And he said, you have to play a home-and-home -home series with the University of Rhode Island. I said, absolutely. And we did. Yeah. I believe we played yeah. four times uh, when I was at Texas. And the only times we did in this one, Al Skinner thought that his, his club wasn't ready for it. And I, you know, whatever Al wanted, I went along with. Uh, and then we played Providence in the years we didn't play Rhode Island so I could come up here with my team. And every year, uh, just about during that time, 88 through 98, Every year, we play the University of Rhode Island or PC. And uh, these people that were my friends in, in 1986 through 88 remained friends. Every summer of my life, I spent in Rhode Island, right here in Narragansett. I usually stayed uh, with, with Judge Frank Caprio and his family, my wife. Susie and, and Joyce Caprio are, are the best of friends. So, and he, by the way, is a PC graduate. And, uh, you know, we just became friends. And he also, at that time, he was a PC. Uh, sure. He was on their board of uh, trustees. He was also one of our biggest boosters at URI because I was the head coach. So, Coach, let me ask you. Look, you, you don't pull punches, so I want to ask you one or two quick things that, that I'll see if you, uh -huh. you really can answer. Did you get contacted before they hired Hurley? Did someone talk to you, or at least boosters? Because the fans sure dropped your name a lot. I know you're not 20 years old anymore, and your health was a little shaky, but they still wanted you back. Did someone call you? No, no. And, and uh, I made it very clear to the president, uh, Dave Dooley, I've uh, gotten to be a good friend, and, and my, my wife Susie and Lynn Dooley are friends, and my wife is on the Women's uh, Basketball Advisory Committee. I told Dave that I would help them if they wanted to, but I wanted that to be quiet if I did. I said I would prefer to not even give, give any input, but please, please interview Al Skinner. <laughs> and they did, to. and they did. And it's uh, a surprise to me when Danny Hurley was involved. And, you know, but it was, I felt, I felt conflicted because of my relationship with Al Skinner. But I've known the Hurleys since they were little kids. And their, their dad, Bob, the high school coach at St. Anthony's, is a guy I have tremendous respect for. And since they've come up here, they've reached out to me, uh, Danny and Bobby, you know, come to practices and they bounce things off me. And it, it's, it's great. Uh, I think these guys were a great choice. Uh, and I still think Al Skinner has a good 10 years in him to be a great coach uh, somewhere. Yeah, I know you had a great yeah. relationship with Al, and you give Al a lot of credit yeah. for easing your way in when you came in, uh, you know, yeah. back in the 80s. But let me ask you about, isn't it awkward? I mean, if I, if I were the head coach of the URI Rams and someone with success like you had with the Rams lived in town, I'd be a little uncomfortable with it maybe. I mean, I think it takes a big man on your side and on the Hurley side for them oh, to absolutely. allow you to do that. Absolutely. There's no question about that. And, and I just I – just, uh, figured that out or thought about that and I, I really didn't want to impose or anything but they knew through the athletic director uh, that you know I'm, I'm here, I'm available and they gave uh, Dan Hurley my phone number 
and he knew me, um, you know, and they, Bobby was around when, when, when our URI team went to that Sweet 16, uh, and he's, he follows college basketball just like all of us do. So I think only a very insecure coach wouldn't take advantage of that uh, because, you know, I, I coached the game for almost 40 years, and I rebuilt seven different programs. And only an insecure person would not take advantage. For instance, when I was the head coach at Tufts University in 1971, two, and three, I, I developed a very close relationship with Red Auerbach, and he even came to some of my practices and games. Wow. And then when I moved to New York, I had four or five ex-coaches come to my practices, talk to my teams, and and other coaches. I, I always had other coaches, when they came to New York City, come to my practice, and uh, either it was by my request or their request, and I had never been afraid of it, but I'm a secure person. You don't miss and it, Coach, I, I, though? You don't miss it? I mean, you're never too old to want to do it a little bit. Don't you watch the game and say, well, wow. You know? It's a health it's a health issue with me and I left the University of Houston because my my cardiologist refused to do surgery that was needed until I got out of coaching. And it wasn't like I was dying by the day, but it's a situation, an electronic thing in my heart that needed the latest device. And he was trying to get me to get out of coaching because he thought that Coaching might be too stressful, and I got an extra six years of coaching uh, with his permission, and I said, well, how about if I win a championship first <laughs> and get back to the NCAAs? And I made that promise to my cardiologist. And, and you know, just Super Bowl Sunday last year, I had to go in for my second open-heart surgery the day after the Super Bowl, because wow. because I'm a Giant and Patriot fan. <laughs> so anyway, so you can't do it. And that's why you it. wrote the book Dead Coach Walking. By the way, pick up the book because it's interesting. Read Dead Coach Walking. All right, last thing, Coach. I appreciate you giving us all this time. Um, give me a feel for the inside. When I talked with Kenny Green, I wanted to ask him what it was like to know when you're when your knees are feeling good and you're jumping, you know you're going to jump higher than everybody else. As a coach, what's it like to know when you're going into the Syracuse game? I mean, it can't be too different than Hurley going into Ohio State, even though there's no pressure early in the season. What are you thinking? Are you thinking, you know, we're going to surprise people? Are you thinking, wow, we're in trouble? Do you admit that to yourself? Get us inside the head of a coach for a minute, will you? No, I, I honestly felt that we were better than Syracuse and that their 2-3 zone was made – for us, we could work the ball and then make sure that Garrick and Owens got the open three. And we ran them out in the first half. And I, I believed in telling the truth to my players. If I thought we were a big underdog, I would tell them and just say, hey, nobody thinks you can win. We're the only ones that think we're going to win. And if you go into this game tight, you, you can't beat them. So... Let's, let's make sure that we're never tight for a ball game. Because during the season, we took some of our home games and moved them up to Providence. And then we took one, West Virginia, and moved it to Madison Square Garden. And our guys blew out a very good West Virginia team. We were in the top 20 ourselves. So, you know, there was a Sports Illustrated had a top 20, which was much better than the... Uh, you know, the polls. So I never felt that we were going to lose to Syracuse. I was challenged a little when we had a whole week to get ready for Duke, and the kids had a little time to listen to everybody tell them how great they were. And despite my warnings, they jumped on us 22-5, to 5, but by halftime, we were up three. And at halftime, 
from then on, it was a back and forth, up and down. Uh, we shared the lead the entire ball game, and uh, lost on a disputed non-call on Silk Owens' is three right before the buzzer. So, you know, I tell the truth to my players. If you don't, it's going to backfire on you. And that's what I advise all coaches to do. You Coach. can't sing the same song night after night. You mm-hmm. can't play that same record. Mm-hmm. you got to be honest with them. Yeah, Before because they're, they're smart. Yeah, be, be, they are smart. And you have to give them credit. Before we hammered Providence, you know, I was tough on them for, for two or three days in practice. And I told them I was not going to settle for anything but a 20-point blowout. And we jumped all over them, and, and then we just had too much for them. And they were a very good basketball team. So that's the way I coach. And there are games when I, I tell them, hey, guys, we're going to have to play the perfect game. And, and they know me by that. They trust me. But you can't play the perfect game if you're tight. Coach, as a good player, does it backfire as a coach? In other words, you must have tremendous insight as a coach because you played. But at the same time, don't you want to run out on the court and grab the ball? I mean, it must the frustration level. You know what I mean? I mean, what's it like to have been a great well, you player? You have to know why and, and, and who. You have to understand why your team is not performing well. If they're executing the offense but can't make shots they make in practice, they're obviously too keyed up, they're too tight, and you got to do something to relax them, even if it's calling a timeout and telling them a joke. And, and uh, you know, I, my father was a coach. I had a great college coach at UConn, and I mastered in their psychology. And, yes, I can watch a game on television and tell you after 10 minutes who should win and why. And, and it's experience, and it's studying the game. And, you know, I had three or four opportunities to coach in the NBA, and at that point in my life and career, I didn't want to. They weren't paying a whole lot more than I was receiving at the University of Texas. And the other one was players had no respect at all for coaches during that era, with the exception of one or two. And, you know, that now they're paying coaches such high money that they rarely fire a guy uh, unless it's obvious they have to. Well, I'll tell you what, Coach, it's been tremendous having you on. Last, uh, last question back to this current team. I know you thought the game would even be rougher than it was today. So um, yeah. give us a feel as a coach for what we should expect what player you're excited about that might be coming next year? Anything for this current team that Rams fans would like to hear? Well, first of all, you can't speed Rhode Island up and get them to play at a wild tempo unless you really overplay the passing lanes and give up some easy layups from time to time. Iowa State played a straight-up man-to-man. Uh, they weren't they weren't getting out on shooters. And Rhode Island, fortunately, hit their first couple of threes. And from that, they gained the confidence to keep taking threes throughout the game. And I looked at the stat sheet at the end. They were 8 for 19, 42% from three-point range. The same as they were basically shooting layups, which is 42%. Uh, and they're not going to face anybody in the A-10 that's better than Ohio State. So the chance of them pulling some upsets this year is very good. I just think it's wrong of fans, though, to expect this team to go from 7-25 and 25 or whatever they were last year, 7-23, and 23, you know, to 15-15 and 15 or, or, you know, even better than that. It's wrong because there's not a lot of talent there's, there's very little physical uh, presence up front, and they have no McDonald's All-Americans in their backcourt. These are kids that, you know, hopefully are going to keep coming on, and I, and I really think that Danny Hurley 
uh, is going to do a great job here at Rhode Island, but I don't expect him to contend for, you know, NCAA bids until his third year. And I'm being realistic. But it's no reason not to be excited about this team and the games that they're going to play, you know, at the, at the Ryan Center. I'm a season ticket holder, and I am not going to miss a game. If my wife is feeling better, I'll be at the game tomorrow because – it's important to show support, number one. And number two, in three years, you're not going to be able to get a good seat to yeah. Ryan Sun. <laughs> and, and I'm serious about that. Rhode Island fans, Rhode Island fans, when they come out and they see what they like, word spreads. And I remember after my third game or so, you know, in Keeney, every game was a sellout there. And when we played George Washington, up in Providence, we had 8,000 people there. Wow. Rhode Island fans are great fans. I think they've been worn down, you know, by the previous year and too many of those years, uh, you know, in the, in, in the uh, Jim Barron era. Jim, Jim's a good guy, uh, but everything fell right for him. He's had a place, uh, you know, now where he can be successful. His son can play with him. And it was time for a change. To a long contract, remember, Coach. That's what you mentioned earlier. Those, those extended contracts can get you in trouble. Yeah, well, that's, I'm glad he has that, though. But anybody who gives anyone a 10-year contract, including Duke, is absolutely out of their mind. And whoever the athletic director and president were at that time, I'd question their sanity. <laughs> you don't pull the punches, Coach. Hey, look, I speak for all the fans in saying thank you for the memories when you were Rhode Island's coach, and thank you for the time here and for staying in Rhode Island and, and being around for the Hurley era and for being on the show, Coach. Well, thank you. I moved here because I love it here. And uh, just think of that if anybody questions my loyalty. I love Rhode Island. And I love the University of Rhode Island. And I heard you say a couple of times in this interview how you enjoyed beating the living daylights out of Providence. So that goes over well, too. <laughs> <laughs> coach Panders, everybody, dead coach walking. Thank you so much for your time, Coach. Thank you, Chip. Appreciate it. Talk to you very Oh, man, just, just a wonderful guy to talk to. And when, when saying that he doesn't pull any punches is saying it uh, too mildly. I mean.